Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 280, The Cost of Healthcare. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. So this week we're going to try to do something different in our health cast. Um, every week we try to present information that's newsworthy or noteworthy where we've done some investigation into a particular medicine, a particular treatment, a particular illness to focus on that and, and provide more depth and texture to the conversation about that mm-hmm. particular issue. And then before and after we actually do the filming, the, those of us who are involved in the process and sit here in the room get into conversations that are segues from what we've been talking about. And they're, they're segues into a broader conversation about how as a society, how as a culture, how uh, as a taxpaying system to the government, mm-hmm. how do we make healthcare policy that's the most effective for the most number of people, the most efficient in generating quality product at minimum mm-hmm. cost. And so we get into conversations about that. Uh, and, and we thought maybe we would share some of that conversation with, with our audience and hopefully invite them to participate in the conversation. So as we talk about some of these things that we're gonna talk about in this episode of our HealthCast, uh, our conceptualization, conceptualization of the issue of societal management of healthcare and personal management of healthcare because we always talk about the importance of being an informed consumer, of mm-hmm. being an active participant in your own healthcare and not just a recipient of it's somebody true. else's decision making. I and I think that the patients yes. and yes. the doctors who are in the system should be the ones that are heard. Mm-hmm. That are the and ones it's not always the way it works. It's, it's rarely not the way it's it works. rarely the way it, yeah. it's worked. We we've high we've elected and pay officials who have no knowledge, most of them have no knowledge of healthcare, don't even participate in the same system as all the other Americans because they have their own system if they're in the Senate or the House or the presidency or the, the uh, I think even the Supreme Court has its own, a different healthcare system. So yeah. they don't even know what they're we in a are system going. That's the gold standard that they don't pay for. Right. For it's, them and their families it's like what and their we staff. Had years ago. That you can't get. That you can't get now. Unless you're a member of the government. And that part of the government. So the, the federal government. So they don't really get it. And they're making all the rules for us, which is really easy. I find it really easy to make rules for other people. I can tell, you know, I don't, I can say, oh, well, so-and-so should, should be doing this. Mm-hmm. Well, I've never walked in that person's shoes. I don't know what they're going through. Unless I sit down and actually listen to them, which I do all day, right. then I don't know what they're going through. So that's a good way, talking to someone, getting the response back, of, of for a problem solver like we are, that's what we do, we problem solve to get the idea of how we should proceed to make this better. The second, the second way that we're going to ask of you who are listening is for you to respond to us right. and we, listen we set to up us a special email account. and send us, a, send us ideas. Send us what you think. And then we will then collate all of that and see if we can, we can feel what you're feeling and see if your ideas would work within the system that we know. Well, I include and, you in the conversation. And help and, and feed it back. And right. then we'll talk about it with all your ideas. Yeah. So if you have something that you would like to share, if something that we say triggers a, an anecdotal story, a personal experience, uh, an opinion, information sharing, whatever, then you can send that to us at this email address, the cost of healthcare at biobalancehealth.com. So if you just take that address and send us your thoughts or your anecdotal story or your questions or comments, what, your reactions, whatever. One, one of the focal points of this conversation, we'd like to do this more than once if we can. So, so we're going to try to talk today about the question of individual responsibility. 
versus government decision making uh, in healthcare management and healthcare mm-hmm. costs. And so examples, you know, if, if you have spent a lifetime, uh, I grew up in an era where most adults smoked, certainly mm-hmm. all the adults that I knew smoked. My parents, my grandparents, in the cars, in the houses, at the restaurants, in the bars, in the movie theaters, on airplanes. I mean, people smoke. But we're in our 60s. Yes. So that's an an era. My son hasn't grown up in that world. Right. And And neither has my daughter. He would be dismayed to visit that world. Right. And Uh, in some places, there still is smoking in bars and... and my daughter comes out and goes, I can't go back there oh, again. Yeah, it's I like can't your breathe. Hair and your clothes. You know, she's a physician. She can't she can't breathe that and think right. that's good. Right. You know, so so this is something that we didn't know was well, we did, but our parents didn't know was a terrible health problem. Everybody seemed to smoke. And at, in our parents' age group, yet we found out, we have knowledge, we found out it causes cancer and all kinds of other diseases. Respiratory illnesses, COPD. I mean, people who are carrying around their oxygen tank. Not all of them, but many of them have been heavy smokers. Mm-hmm. So, And that's a huge cost to the system. People who have been smokers knowing that smoking is maybe, if they're lucky it won't, but there's not that many people that are that lucky, maybe and probably will cause major health uh, issues, including heart disease. I've, I even left that out, and that's probably the primary right. illness that it, it causes. Yeah, the, the one thing that people seem to have learned is lung cancer right? and, and the correlates of mm-hmm. lung cancer and smoking. And then but, they say, oh, it's not in my family. Well, I don't care if it's in your family or not. If you're smoking then you're going to put it into your family history for the rest, for your children, because... Well, the risk of secondary effects or secondary right. smoke. Uh, but, but part of the end of the conversation becomes, if you made the decision to smoke in your lifetime, and now you're in your 60s, 70s, 80s, and you're starting to have significant health care issues that come at significant health care costs... Mm-hmm. How much of that responsibility should belong to you and how much should belong to society to pay for or provide for that, either directly through a Medicaid payment that the government absorbs that we've all paid for, or indirectly through increased hospitalization costs, doctor costs, health care uh, costs, insurance costs that, that we all pay for as well. Um, if, if we didn't deal as a society, if we didn't pay for the consequences of smoking, right. we would save billions of dollars. Right, but not we would assign certain people then to death. No, I'm not I'm not suggest I'm not saying that that's the answer. I'm just saying how no, it's, the enormity it's of the, the problem. Yes, absolutely. The enormity of the dollars. <clears throat> now, what I will say to start out with on this whole conversation is mm-hmm. the cheapest thing is death. So, there is no way to judge medicine and its success by saving money, okay? So you can't just go, oh, successful medicine is cheaper. In fact, that's not true. So successful medicine is not cheaper because death is the cheapest thing. So if everybody dies early, we save money. Now, that's not at all what I'm suggesting. I'm just saying we can't look at medicine like we look at other industries. You don't mean to suggest that as a social policy. No, I mean, I'm I'm against that as a social policy. I'm saying that... When Claire McCaskill asked me to lunch years ago and said, how do we judge monetary savings and balance it with good health care? I said, that's going to be really difficult. That is not going to be like any other industry in this country. If I make a widget for cheaper and it's a good widget, then... That's a better system. Mm -hmm. If I am cheaper with medicine, most of the time there's mortality and morbidity. Somebody gets sicker. Somebody can't go to work. How do you, how do we quantitate that? Other countries say, well, our our healthcare system is socialized and we have the cheapest system in the world. Well, that's great, but they, we haven't looked at how many days of work is lost. We haven't looked at how early they die. We haven't looked at how many people are sucking it up and walking around with bad hips, bad knees, bad, bad anything, or in pain? You know, maybe they're, maybe they're tougher than we are, but, 
But you can't say that society is a better healthcare system because they've saved money. You have to look at all these other parameters. You don't just calculate dollar costs. You don't. You can't. It doesn't equate with good business. You know, there's a couple of business people like Collins who wrote books that said you can't get inexpensive and quality and ease of use in any industry. You, one of those you're going to lose. Mm -hmm. So it's either going to be more expensive, easy, and quality, mm -hmm. or it's going to be cheaper with no quality. I mean, it doesn't happen. And that's the case with even medicine. Well, let's look at an example that a lot of Americans have some familiarity with. I mean, you may not know a lot. You may not have experienced uh, cancer, heart attacks, uh, hip replacement in your 70s, those kind of things personally. Mm -hmm. But almost everybody's <clears throat> had to take some kind of medicine, get some kind of prescription. Mm -hmm. And so the cost of prescription medicine is a conversation that I hear a lot socially. People talk about how their prescriptions have increased in cost. Drastically the this copay, year. Well, certainly the, this the medicines year. themselves and the copays, mm -hmm. because the medicines have gone up. This year, we have seen tons of medicines, even generics, mm -hmm. go way up because it's generics are no longer inexpensive and, and they've run the patent. They buy new patents. <laughs> they do. They there are tricks. They, they being the pharmaceutical company that yeah. owns the patent on the on the drug, right. so mm -hmm. they can control the market and control the price of the product. So, if the pharmaceutical <clears throat> companies make this decision and raise these prices, then people are just stuck, and so they try to find creative or alternative solutions. Some people actually put together uh, like elder hostile travel buses mm -hmm. that take you to Canada or Mexico mm -hmm. where you can buy drugs mm -hmm. cheaper and then bring them back into the United States. Mm -hmm. So then the drug companies and the Congress are trying to limit your ability to do that. Right, which uh, which limits our freedom. With so You can go to Toronto and buy the same drug that you get at your pharmacy in St. Louis, Chicago, San Francisco. You can get it a lot cheaper in Toronto. Less than half, usually, on most drugs. And the question drugs. that gets asked is why? Why does it cost $10 in Toronto? Same drug made by the same company in the same factory and shipped to pharmacies all over America at $100. I'm paying $10 or $20 or $30 for it in Toronto or in mm -hmm. Laredo. And and so they people that live within reasonable driving distance of the Canadian of border country. and the Mexican border go back and forth to buy their medicines. And it's not, I, I believe that that's not probably legal. No, I don't think it is. And I think, and I know as a physician, it's not legal right. for me if I'm administering a drug. Tell somebody, yeah. Well, no, I can t I, I can talk about it, but I can't buy a drug in another country mm -hmm. and then use it on my patient. Mm -hmm. And like, say, say pellets were outlawed, or you know, we use pellets every day in my practice. Pellets of testosterone and estrogen, pure bioidentical estrogen and testosterone that can't be patented. And they're made by compounding pharmacies. If that was outlawed, then it would be illegal for me to go to Canada and buy them or Mexico and buy them and bring them back and use them on patients. Mm -hmm. I would lose my license. Mm -hmm. That is illegal. Now, first of all, why is that illegal? Maybe it's quality. Maybe it's just that. Well, not if it's made by an American drug company and yeah, shipped to, to Mexico in general, and sold. And in I mean, general, that's what we see. When yeah. we, we go and look at the at pharmacies in Mexico. When we go to Mexico, we've gone there to write books and other stuff. So we, we go in the pharmacies, we look at the prices, and it's outrageously cheap. Not just because the dollar is strong well, right a, now. A simple example of an antibiotic. You buy 100 tablets of an antibiotic for about $100 in Mexico. You bring mm, them home, less. you're not allowed to give those to anybody. I mean, you can take them. No, I can take them. You can take them for yourself. Yeah. You have them. But you can't give, as a physician, I can you can't get give 100 them to tablets of Cipro right. for 30 bucks. $30. And I can't get a prescription for 14 Cipro, for one course of Cipro, for even close to that amount of money. Right. So I'm getting, I can get multiple times that that I can take myself but cannot give to a patient. That I mean, I clearly understand the law, and I wouldn't do that. So, but why can't 
Why is this? Well, Why is the same drug made by the same company cheaper? And, and part cheaper? of what starts this conversation, and when we're off camera, we get pretty irate about it. <laughs> uh, the, the story irate? this year about uh, the hedge fund manager who bought a drug company and then overnight, unilaterally, on his own recognizance, raised the price of a critical cancer drug $700 overnight. So if you bought the pill today, it cost you $100. Mm -hmm. If you bought it tomorrow, it cost you $800. Mm -hmm. And he's entitled to It was to more than that. that. It was thousands. Was it? It was abuse. Well, I it was it horrible abuse. abuse. But I, I, ta I take a medication for, for inflammation for my heart. Uh-huh. So I have to take it. There's nothing else. There's only one medication. It went off. It went off patent, okay, mm -hmm. this past month. And so I order three-month supply. My three-month supply, last, last time I ordered it, before it went off patent, was $1,200 for three months. It's outrageous. I can't get it cheaper. Right. I can't get it cheaper in the U.S. I would have to take a trip somewhere else to mm -hmm. get it. But... And it would have the same quality. But now it's generic, and now it's $950. That's that's still outrageous. It's still outrageous. I mean, it's a huge amount of money. Outrageous for for, for Celebrex right. is what it's as is what it's called. Generic equivalent. Celebrex, which is the only of it one of its type. So some company had to have bought it and cornered the market on it right. and then said, we're just gonna keep the price up. Now, here's where our government isn't doing anything. And this is where I find they control our airlines. They control, I mean, they control right, right, absolutely. airlines because it is a, the FAA airlines, they consider it a ne necessary part of being in America is to have the right to fly. So they control their, their ability to, to, um, to go on strike. They can, I mean, they do. I mean, they've, they've, ordered people back to work as, as, uh, as I guess there was the air, air traffic control. Air traffic control, Ronald Reagan. They've done this with other, other, uh, industries. They've done it with, they've broken up the phone company so that they can't have a monopoly. They've broken up lots of other companies because they cornered the market. Right. Now, pharmaceutical companies are doing much more to corner the market and hold us all hostage for our medications that we absolutely need to live a productive and su and successful. We want to be Americans want so, to be successful and but productive. It's, it's more complex than just and saying live. they're robbing everybody. They're they're cornering the market and they're taking advantage of us. Uh, you, there's a cost factor for doing research. There's a cost factor no, and, for getting a drug approved and certified by the FDA, which is government agency. And that's that a problem because it shouldn't be that expensive. It's a different uh, situation. And, and we can have another one of these conversations about the FDA and the political manipulation of decision-making in the FDA. Like the, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, who decided because of her personal beliefs, she wasn't going to allow people to sell the morning-after pill. Over the counter. Over the counter. Uh, right. And just one and person. All the doctors, all the scientists, the FDA, years of research came to the conclusion this is something that we ought to allow and we ought to do. That individual female said, wait a minute, I'm in charge. And I say, no, you can't have it. So and that's a discussion about the FDA. Right. Uh, so there are conversations. And, and what we want to do is not get bogged down in who shot John and you did too and no, you didn't kind of argument. Uh, we want to talk about how do you make a cogent or coherent social policy that addresses some of these issues? What is the best answer? What is the right answer? What is the most workable answer? You know, we're not talking about the perfect solution. We're talking about a solution that addresses a lot of these factors. A, a, another example, when we've talked about the cost of drugs, we've talked about mm -hmm. cost of some procedures, we've mm -hmm. talked about the, the social or secondary cost of smoking over a lifetime. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I have a motorcycle, I ride a motorcycle. The, there are states that require a helmet, there are states that don't. If I'm riding in a state that doesn't require one and I choose not to wear one, and then I get a head injury, who should pay for that? Who, you know, the rest of the society? Or me. That's who's paying for it now. Exactly. So now you can be as stupid as you want to be. You can climb a mountain. <laughs> you, you, you can climb a mountain and you can fall off 
because you're climbing a mountain, we're going to send out helicopters and spend that that's your tax dollars at work to get one person off a mountain who decided they wanted to climb that mountain and fall off. Well, and it some, doesn't cost them. Sometimes they get bills for that. Yeah, later. well, if they can't pay it, they that don't they pay can't it. pay, right. So or they say they can't pay it. I mean, are they going to take them to collections? Really? So so this is something, I mean, it's, yeah. this is something that. It's a different that, accounting ca- uh, category. We, I think that this is a very, this is a more difficult question than pharmaceuticals. Right. This is a question of risk taking. Risk taking. We and and I believe that we have a, a duty to the people who are they're disabled. They they have no way of taking care of themselves. They yes. they're and yes. children and people who absolutely are and will always have the poor or the sick that can't take care of themselves and can't pay for anything. As a society, we're supposed to take care of that. Well, that's but what you believe, and that's I what believe I believe. That. I believe that. I mean, I think have, that's But you a, have examples of, like, a young athlete who takes steroids to spike up his performance module so that he can get a pro contract for millions of dollars. Yeah. And then years later, pays the cost of that. Right. I mean, that he pays it by being and, infertile and, and going so, having to go through infertility and... And all medical other, issues that start right. to happen and that insurance... Hospitals, pharmacies, all contribute to the care of at greater cost than what his copay is. So we're talking so. about drinking, smoking, eating too much, not exercising, not being healthy. Lifestyle choices. Lifestyle choices. Should we pay for that in our in our ever ever increasing healthcare dollar? We were supposed to get the ACA was supposed to give us. More insurance for less money, and it didn't. And that is a tr- that's a truism. People are paying more and more every single year, and the deductible gets bigger. What it did do, at, if we're looking at the government's insurance, it, what it did do is it gave young adults more years to be under their parents' insurance, which I think was a very, right. very important thing mm-hmm. because young adults We've extended adolescence so far in America, so that they're not people aren't aren't adults supposedly and having jobs until they're thirty. So we needed to extend the age that we were taking care of the health care needs of our children. I mean, that's true. If society's going to extend adolescence that long, then we better let the family pay for the insurance or have them on our insurance plan. Yeah. So so that was really good. One of the other things that I'm kind of ambivalent for on is that they took the age and health background of someone out of the equation in determining what they pay for insurance. So well, that works for me. I'm older, so I would have to pay more. Well, but it, it, the rubric for that is what they call pre-existing conditions. Right. And and the, the concept is to provide for portability. So there, there were people who had sick children. Mm-hmm. Who had significant health care costs? Mm-hmm. Who could never change jobs because right. they had insurance through their job. And that was brilliant. I mean, and that they now changed they can that. Change jobs, and right? You don't have, have to have insurance. it tied to your insurer. Exactly. So to that's your employer. Yeah. So they. So, sorry, they're your employer. That's two really good things that happened. Mm-hmm. But the one thing we were trying to do is save money and allow people to afford their insurance. And the insurance industry just keeps taking money well, but, out of but the But an argument gets made about that. Total dollar systemic costs versus individual costs. When when you have a significant proportion of the population whose only medical in exposure is hospital room emergency care, that's a significant societal cost. Right. And, and so you have an individual who always went to the emergency room who now has insurance and goes to a doctor. Yes, it may cost more per doctor visit or per prescription for that individual, mm-hmm. but is society paying less? Or is it just moving it to a different pocket? I mean, those, those are conversations that we want to have. We'd like to hear from you. If you have something to contribute, something to share, an opinion, we'll, we'll revisit this conversation in three weeks uh, from when this podcast is, is posted. You can contact us at costofhealthcare at biobalancehealth.com. And we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. You can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. 
For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BiobalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BiobalanceHealth. Find Brett Newcomb at BrettNewcomb.com. 